We've already seen how to take the derivative of e to the x. For this magical number e, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. It is its own derivative. So now we ask, what happens if we use a different base for the exponential? What if we do 2 to the x or 3 to the x? A function like that. Let's find out. Now we ask, what about the exponential function a to the x if we have a different base a? Well, to answer this question, we first need to remember a few things about the logarithm. The logarithm, in particular we're going to use the logarithm with base e, the natural logarithm, it's just the inverse of the exponential function. In other words, if you say that e to the x is equal to y, if you have to raise e to the x power to get the number y, that's the same thing as saying that the natural log of y is x. In other words, natural log of y just means what do I have to raise e to to get y? What do I have to raise e to to get y? I have to raise it to the x power if the natural log of y is equal to x. Okay, so that's the basic property of the natural logarithm. It's the inverse of the exponential function. And if you let x be the natural log of this other number a, we then get that e to the natural log of a is equal to a. That follows from this equivalence. In other words, the exponential and the natural logarithm, they undo each other. So here, if you haven't seen this notation before, ln, it just stands for the natural logarithm, and it just means log with base e. That's what ln means. It's the logarithm with base this number e. Okay, so now that we've recalled all that, let's now compute the derivative of a to the x. And we're again going to use the definition in terms of the limit. And the first part of the calculation is exactly the same as for e to the x. So I'm going to go through it quickly. So again we see that the derivative of an exponential function is some constant defined in terms of a limit times the exponential function itself. This is one way to say what exponential functions are. That constant of proportionality, it looks just like the formula before we had for e, but instead of e here, we have this other number a. So we need to figure out what that constant of proportionality is. In this case, the constant of proportionality given by this formula, reminiscent to what we had before, can be evaluated by using the fact that a is e to the ln of a. That's the trick we're going to use to evaluate this limit. So where does this equation come from? It comes from the fact that e to the ln of a, the exponential and the natural logarithm, undo each other. e to the ln of a is equal to a, so I make that replacement here. Okay, continuing the calculation, what does this mean? We get e to the h times ln of a, using the rules for exponents, minus 1 divided by h. And now I'm going to multiply by 1 in a clever way. I'm going to multiply top and bottom by the natural log of a. Why in the world would I do that? Well, it's because I'm going to introduce a new variable, t. t is going to be equal to h times the natural logarithm of a. It's just a new name for that number. Notice that as h goes to 0, because a is just some number, it's a constant, the variable t will also go to 0. As h goes to 0, multiplying by the natural logarithm, we still approach 0. So now we can reframe this entire limit using this new variable. Check it out. We have e to the h times ln of a. What's h times ln of a? That's just t. So we have e to the t minus 1 upstairs. 
That's times the natural logarithm of a. What do we have downstairs? We have h times the natural logarithm of a. That's just t. Oh, but this is starting to look familiar. Check it out. We have the limit as t approaches 0 of e to the t minus 1 over t. We computed that limit before for e. That's exactly the limit that we computed before for e right here. The limit as t approaches 0 of e to the t minus 1 over t. But we were using the variable h. That doesn't matter. If we use t or h, it's still going to be equal to 1. The limit of that fraction is approaching 1. And 1 times the natural log is just the natural log. So what did we just find out? The constant of proportionality that's regulating the growth of the exponential function with base a is the natural logarithm. That's one meaning of the natural logarithm. We just figured out that this constant of proportionality is the natural logarithm. So we get natural log of a times a to the x for the derivative of a to the x. So, in summary, the derivative of e to the x is itself, and more generally, the derivative of a to the x is the natural log of a times a to the x. How's it going, Lucy? 75 words. Oh, wait a minute, 76. Oh, 77. Good work, Lucy. Oh, that's 78. Agent Cooper asked me to find as many words as I could that contain the letters B, T, and R. Let's compute the derivative of 2 to the x. First of all, this is not equal to x times 2 to the x minus 1. That's what we would get if we just blindly applied the power rule, bringing the exponent down and then subtracting 1 from the exponent. That does not make sense. That is not the answer. Why is that? It's because 2 to the x is a different thing than x squared. To apply the power rule, the x has to be in the base. You have to be raising x to some number. That's not what's going on here. We're taking the derivative of the function 2 to the x. The variable x is up there in the exponent. Instead, we should use the rule for the derivative of exponential functions with general base. That says that the derivative is again 2 to the x, but with this constant of proportionality given by the natural log of 2 out front. So that is the correct derivative. Next up, let's compute the derivative of this function f of x equals 3 to the x times cosine of x. We're going to use our rule for the derivatives of exponential functions, but we'll also have to use the product rule, because this is the product of 3 to the x times cosine of x. So I'll first write out what we get according to the product rule. It's the derivative of the first function times the second, plus the first function times the derivative of the second. Now let's evaluate those derivatives. The derivative of 3 to the x is natural log of 3 times 3 to the x, and then we have our cosine of x coming along for the right. Next up, we have 3 to the x times the derivative of cosine. The derivative of cosine, it's not sine, it's minus sine. So there's our derivative. Uh, we can factor out a 3 to the x, why not? Let's do it. We get 3 to the x times the natural log of 3 cosine of x minus sine of x. There you go. Next up, let's take the derivative of 1.76 to the u times e to the u. The u here is the variable. That's the variable that's changing. We're going to measure the instantaneous rate of change by taking the derivative with respect to u. The d by du tells us that u is the variable that we're taking the derivative with respect to. This is the product of two functions, so we have to use the product rule. Let me write that out first. We'll be taking the derivative of 1.76 to the u times e to the u plus 
1.76 to the u times the derivative of e to the u, like that. Okay, now let's take those derivatives. Out front we have the natural log of 1.76 times 1.76 to the u times e to the u. And for the second piece we have 1.76 to the u times the derivative of e to the u. The exponential function is its own derivative. From our point of view it's because the term that would be here, the natural log of the base, natural log of e, is 1. So that's the answer. Again, we can factor out this common exponential, 1.76 to the u. Why not? Let's do it. And so we get 1.76 to the u times the natural log of 1.76 times e to the u plus e to the u. Oh, and there's a common factor of e to the u as well. Why don't we factor that out as well? We get 1.76 to the u times e to the u times natural log of 1.76 plus 1. Not bad. Let's hit the road. Come on, Buster, I'm buying. On your tail, Gordon. Let's do a real world application of exponential functions. A virus is spreading around the globe. The total number of people who have been infected after t days is given by the function v of t. It is 52 times 1.06 to the t. In this problem, we'll find the total number of infected people on days 0, 100, 200, and 300 of the pandemic, and then we'll find the number of new infections per day on those days. So first, we just need to find the total number of infected people overall on these days. That amounts to just plugging in these t values into the function to see how many people are infected according to this model. Let's do it. If we plug in v of 0, we'll be taking 1.06 to the 0th power and multiplying it by 52. And that's just 52 people. So that's a general fact about these exponential functions. If you have something to the t multiplied by a constant, then the value at 0 is just that constant. Next up we need to plug in 100. That'll be 52 times 1.06 to the 100. And now if you plug that into a calculator, you'll get 17,643. So in those first 100 days, we got a lot more infections. Let's see, how about 200 days? That means we plug in 200 into the function. How many people are infected then? It's 5,986,547. My oh my, this thing's really spreading, ain't it? Okay, and finally, let's find out how many people are infected overall on day 300. That means we plug in 300 into the function. We get 2 billion, 31 million, 247,871 people. Good grief, this thing has almost got half of humanity. What a mess. All right, so that answers the first question, the total numbers of infected people on these days. We now need to find the number of new infections per day. So we need to interpret what that means. Well, that's a rate of change, right? If we're interested in the number of new infections per day, that's exactly the rate of change of the total number of people infected. It's how much the total number of infections is changing per day. So to find that, since it's a rate of change, we got to use the derivative. So let's compute the derivative of this function v. 
Let's see, I'll write that in a different way to remind you what the function was. It was 52 times 1.06 to the t, and we're taking the derivative of that function. We've got to be really careful where the t is. That 52, that's just a constant. That's out front. It's 1.06 that's being raised to the tth power. So that constant just comes out front. It's going to get multiplied by the derivative of 1.06 to the t. And that is the natural log of 1.06 times 1.06 to the t by our rules for the derivatives of exponential functions. Now that we have a formula for the rate of change, the derivative, we can start plugging in these particular t values to find the rates of change. First of all, what was the rate of change when the pandemic started? On day zero of the pandemic, that would just be v prime of zero. Well, if you plug in zero into this function, I'll write it out, you'll be getting the net, uh, you'll be getting 52 times the natural log of 1.06 times 1.06 to the zero. Well, that term's gonna be one, right? So it's just 52 times the natural log of 1.06. And if you plug that into a calculator, you'll get about 3.03. .03. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, there's about three new infections per day. Not so bad. So again, that's the number of new infections per day. It seems like we have this thing under control. If only three people are being infected every day, we should be able to contain its spread. But the problem with exponential growth is that the more people you have infected, the more infecting they're going to do. Let's check out the rate of change 100 days later. That would be 52 times the natural log of 1.06 times 1.06 to the 100 power. What's that going to be? If you plug that into a calculator, you'll get 1,028 and change, 0 0.08 something or other. So again, that's the number of new infections per day. So just in the first 100 days, we've seen the rate of change of this exponential function go from around three to over a thousand, over a new, a thousand new infections per day. Exponential growth means that the rate of change is directly proportional to the amount of stuff that's there. Here, 1.06 to the t, times 52. That's the original function. That's the number of people infected. And we're magnifying that by the natural log of 1.06. That constant of proportionality, that's telling us that the more folks we have, the faster the rate of change. Let's finish up the problem by finding the rate of change on days 200 and 300. If we plug 200 into that derivative function, we'll get 52 times the natural log of 1.06 times 1.06 to the 200th power. Plugging that in, we get 348,829 and some decimal. That's the number of new infections per day. pandemic has accelerated so fast that now we're adding almost 350,000 new infections every day as it spreads. Let's see how bad it gets by day 300. The rate of change on day 300 is going to be given by plugging in 300 into the derivative, like so. If we do that, we get 118 million 358,595. That's the number of new infections per day, according to this model. So, we've seen that we've gone from just around three new cases every day, over the course of 300 days as the virus spreads, we're adding over 100 million new infections every day because of that exponential growth.
Diane, I'm holding in my hand a small box of chocolate bunnies. Diane, I'm holding in my hand a small box of chocolate bunnies. 